appreciate it. Thanks for inviting me here. Um, Uh, so, once upon a time, uh, there were uh, very uh, um, naive moments. Uh, where is the highway really heading? In fact, life in cyberspace seems to be shaping up exactly like Thomas Jefferson would have wanted. Uh, the Supreme Court in 96 writes, um, uh, any person with a phone line can become a town crier, the voice of the residents call it, and the for any soapbox, etc., etc. Um, the 1990s were a period in which um, uh, many had enormous expectations for democracy in the network. Uh, mm -hmm. I, among others, um, uh, wrote about, uh, about this. We were at the time all largely engaged in, uh, I guess I should be on this side, wait a minute, uh, how do I hand uh, we were all largely engaged in armchair uh, theorizing. Uh, we looked a little bit, uh, we uh, looked at a few uh, um, uh, online materials, and we developed a discourse that largely went in the direction of more or less sophisticated versions of uh, the recreation of a public sphere that is decentralized, that allows anyone uh, to speak with much greater ease than in the mass media versus uh, uh, Cass Sunstein was the one who sort of was the focal point of the position that it caused fragmentation, polarization, uh, because everybody was talking to uh, uh, each uh, to themselves. And there's more of a, of a, what I think is a reasonably decent literature review in the first of the two papers that the second only points to uh, in terms of trying to map that uh, um, the, from around 2004 till four or five years ago, I'd say the state of the art in trying to get beyond uh, uh, this kind of, of theorizing were various efforts with greater and lesser degrees of sophistication, though this was probably the most influential for its time by Wada Adamich and Nancy Lance, uh, of taking uh, a curated set of blogs, providing a static snapshot of those blogs, counting the links between them, and creating a network map of the blogs as nodes, the links as uh, um, uh, uh, degrees, and uh, describing the shape of the uh, political debate around this uh, structure that, at least in this model, suggested that in fact we saw polarization, that in different presentations we in fact showed that there were uh, very few highly connected nodes and a lot of nodes uh, that weren't um, um, connected at all. Uh, so the fragmentation story, or uh, the polarization story, was supposedly proven uh, the fragmentation story was not, and instead we have, again, I'm just throwing up some of the early things that made these claims, not everyone. There's a lot of work, obviously, that I'm not going to cover here. Um, but the claim was that you saw not fragmentation, but actually reconcentration, and that the hope of a more diversified network public sphere was, in fact, uh, false, because a small number of sites garnered a huge amount of the attention, you could talk, but no one would hear it. Um, and that was not uh, democracy. Um, when I wrote the, the uh, Wealth of Networks in the relevant chapter, I have a lot of quibbles with the interpretation of these data, with the interpretation of other similar link analyses, uh, suggesting that in fact what we saw, even if one in six links were across a divide, that's not polarization, that's more or less how we are when we talk. We talk and, uh, uh, talk with people we agree with and then sometimes across the divide. Um, but the data was largely like this. I'd say in the last seven, eight years, a variety of other methodological advances uh, uh, have been made. Uh, some of them, uh, a lot of them depended on trying to begin to roll 
quantitative analysis and actual case study uh, and survey with link analysis so that link analysis provides some of the structure, some of the clarity about what ought and or ought not to be uh, 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 studied so that you're not just picking friends from a crowd when you're doing qualitative studies. Um, uh, Esther Hargitay uh, and collaborators did, I'd say, the first substantial uh, one of these. Uh, there are various forms of reinterpretation. Aaron Shaw and I did one that looked at the fact that actually left and right looked quite different. Uh, a sub theme that has gone throughout this period has been not about democratic participation, but about social mobilization with strong crossovers and whether or not what you see are new forms of organizations uh, that are separating from old forms of organization. Um, uh, these were not built on link analysis, they were built, built more on case studies. And part of what we've been trying to do here with Media Cloud for several years, a collaboration between the Berkman Center and uh, Easton Zuckerman's uh, group initially when he was still at the Berkman Center, later on MIT, Center for Civic Media, uh, is to build a new tool set with which we begin to be able to answer these questions in a more detailed form, more dynamic. Um, and so MediaCloud uh, is a database whose core functionality is to crawl 85,000 feeds from 35,000 different uh, media crawlers, ingesting about 300,000 news stories per day. At the moment, it's got about 360 million stories, uh, uh, about 4 million sentences. Um, continuously collect. One of the uh, analysis tools we built on top of this data set is Controversy Mapper, which is the particular tool set for, that I used for, this, for these two uh, papers. Um, and Controversy Mapper, in terms of adding to the data, begins with this set that we create essentially a continuous suggestion of the history of the day uh, uh, going on, identifies a controversy, and I'll talk a little bit about what a controversy is, and then goes out and crawls the rest of the web, everything that's out on the open web, everything that's available in a non-private, non-proprietary form, crawls anything that's linguistically related and creates its own curated subset that includes both things that we captured on an ongoing basis and things that were linked to or linked to that particular data set to create a controversy. So what are controversies? Controversies are political debates that occur uh, temporarily and uh, in a dynamic form. Uh, um, they are essentially a, a series of communications and actions around the core set of connections issues. The critical thing that differentiates them from the earlier generation of efforts to snapshot the network public sphere is that they are they have a sequence, they have a political context, they have discursive dynamics, um, uh, and they are defined by a set of linguistic markers that are a reasonably good proxy for a set of political issues that people see themselves as being engaged in. Um, like in the other studies, links are a proxy for attention. Um, uh, the other thing we don't do is we don't privilege the collection of sites. So in the ideal form, and of course, as I said, there's lots of work bridging. This is not we suddenly invested the, the, the telescope. All of you guys should stop looking at the sky with your naked eye. Uh, um, but generally, the focus is on dy 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 dynamics as opposed to static, on discovered nodes based on crawling around the controversy with a limiting aspect being topical rather than type of node. It's not that you have 500 things that you define as nodes from these five uh, lists, which we used to be the way, but rather anything that connects this turns out to be important, as you'll see uh, in the Silver Pippa story. Multi-platform, not only single platform, not only blogs being connected, but whatever is out there that's available, that doesn't mean everything. Uh, um, one of the things that biased, I think, very strongly the old pictures we saw with blogs is that a fit, there was no internal analysis of what is the nature of the link. And so affinity links, log, bro, log roles, uh, strongly influenced that polarization that we saw because they weren't actually attention links, they were affinity links very often. Um, story level links allow us to know what specifically is being targeted in the conversation as opposed to not. Um, and this is, to me, critical. 
I think machine analysis has severely limited our ability to understand rather than improved it. And I'd say the most powerful set of uses that come to me out of these cases is that a well curated, justi empirically justified set of human observation targets is the thing that we're looking for. But it continues to require substantial reading and familiarity with the underlying materials in order to make sense of uh, these numbers. So the first paper that I want to talk about, um, one last thing. Um, there is a temptation to argue that the two papers I show you now prove something. They don't. That's not what they're for. They are two case studies of two extremely, extremely successful efforts that use a particular set of network dynamics to achieve an implausibly ambitious political goal. And they are chosen because they are, they, the signal that they offer to the system is so high that if we can't see what's happening with our system on this situation, then the system won't show anything. There is a next generation of work that needs to be done to throw this at a much broader set of controversies that don't necessarily have these patterns for which it might not be. So this is, to the extent that this answers whether the network public sphere in fact displaces the mass media public sphere or not, the answer is we don't know yet, but it might, it has worked at least twice in this case. More importantly, the internal dynamics of how network mobilization happened fall out of these data quite uh, attractive. And so that's most of what I'm going to be doing is telling you the stories of these two things together with particular kinds of dynamics that were predicted based on less complete uh, 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 or, or focused data. Uh, so the first is this piece on Sopa Pepa. Uh, the thing to remember is that in September, uh, uh, of, of uh, 2010, um, uh, Congress, or in this case the Senate, starts a bipartisan bill, a bill and bail Monday would make it easier for the Justice Department to shut down websites that try to fire the music, movies, and public goods. Senate Judiciary Committee, Lady Hatch, Chamber of Commerce, sorry. I thought so. Oh. Um, very bipartisan, very strong uh, support from Hollywood, the RIA, uh, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, billions of dollars, $58 billion a year worth of uh, uh, value, etc. Easy. 16 months later, Wikipedia shuts down for a day, and the framing of the entire controversy, imagine a world without free knowledge. The next day after Wikipedia shut down and the massive protests occur, all of the supporting Congress largely falls away, and uh, the bill is adopted. It's very hard to make causal claims from things, but it's very hard to find situations where this is the day before. This is ProPublica, identifying public statements by members of Congress, pro and anti. Uh, these are opponents of SOPA, these are supporters the day before. These are supporters, these are opponents the day after. You're not going to find better causal evidence than that that protests shut down this particular piece of legislation. Um, and one of the fascinating things, uh, there was a New York Times story uh, the, the, on the Friday after this Wednesday that had these two characteristics. The first one was the view of Chris Dodd, who's the chief lobbyist at that point of, of the uh, MPAA of Hollywood, walking days through the halls of Congress not understanding what hit him. And the New York Times trying to tell a story about how Google and Facebook, the new kids in town, came to town, and now there's other muscle across. And I think one of the things that our study fairly clearly shows is that that's probably not the right story. The story is much more complex, much more dynamic, much more one that's about the classic network public sphere than not. Really? Wow, I'm, I'm not going to do it in 20 minutes, I'm sorry. Um, the first thing to see, this is very dynamic and spiky over time. So um, uh, it starts out very small. Most of these early links are situated, uh, most of these early spikes are, situ are moments at which Congress is doing something and then the world is responding to it. Starting here, it's about what the network public sphere is trying to organize and only occasionally responding to things Congress does 
and ultimately the organization, and then it all falls away. So there's a long-term bill that's very slow. So when you look at the maps, they look very similar, but to be very big here is a very different story than to be very big here. The justification is that this conversation doesn't happen except as a continuation of this justification. The big voices here continue to be major voices over here, and they continue to be this. So in this case, Let's just use, uh, and I hope I'm not too much, uh, that's disappointing. Uh, I hope I'm not too much in the way. So one of the things to realize, this is just an online uh, uh, interface we have, we did with our data. One of the things that's been very true throughout the entire story is that tech media played a more important role than traditional media. Uh, why are three breaks that there's, other than the hill, there's no coverage in anything that's not tech media. Uh, very quickly, you get an organization. Ooh, this is really weird. Uh, other than, uh, uh, very quickly you see Wired, Tech Dirt emerges early on, and the EFF comes on. You see demand progress, and so one of the things that you'll see is that special purpose organizations begin to emerge, special purpose websites begin to emerge, uh, but also a membership organization like EFF continues to play uh, throughout. When Koika reaches uh, 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 when, when Koika, the original version, uh, reaches the Senate, Senator Wyden plays as a whole. One of the interesting things to see here is, here's Hot Air, the, the uh, major right-wing blog. Um, uh, here's Cato, uh, together with Dave Cost over there. What you're seeing very interestingly emerge very early on is a left-right alliance. Because within the libertarian framework, IP, at least for half the crowd, is a form of regulation. Very early on, this alliance emerges and remains throughout, anchored very much, and this comes more out of interviews than out of the data, but the data is what caused us to go identify these particular people, very much with back, uh, with, 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 with back conversations between Dave Siegel and Dave Moon of, of uh, Demand Progress and Patrick Ruffini, who set up uh, uh, Don't Censor the Net and who does a lot of work on, on, on the right wing uh, of the blogosphere. But this continues to be uh, typical. In May, things move to DC. From the EFF, public knowledge starts to take a substantial role within DC. These organizations become important loci of knowledge about how the actual uh, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, yeah, two and a half. Uh, become local <laughs> low side of knowledge um, uh, and what you see is that they become they, they serve to facilitate uh, the network. Uh, but one of the things that you see is the emergence of petitions. Don't censor the net, lots of other petitions are again uh, to be thrown up on both the left and the right. Um, in the summer lull, the other thing that begins to emerge, and emerge and you see this throughout the period, are different claims of authority and expertise. Union Square Ventures uh, comes along and starts to create a, a, a VC uh, source. Um, one of the core predictions of the static blogosphere set of models is that things that begin high will remain high. It's going to be hard to break through. And when you look at the static images, you see power concentrated and stabilized in top, uh, in top sites. Fight for the Future was nowhere to be seen in the first 12 months or, or 13 months. It appears in as SOPA, as the house version is brought forward, it appears, it emerges, and from here on, it becomes a central player um, anchored in, in uh, Worcester, Massachusetts, um, uh, created people who came out of the Participatory Culture Foundation, um, uh, and they end up uh, uh, creating much of the uh, core uh, information. Um, one of the things I want you to see is, again, something that doesn't exist before suddenly emerges. This is AmericanCensorship.org. It's a mobilization. It's a moment where, essentially, uh, people show up, 
and say, I'm going to put on my website a don't censor me sign, and they, uh, um, and they uh, link to this site that then uh, communicates with, uh, allows them to communicate with Congress. So again, one of the things we've seen throughout this period is over 30 special purpose experiments, experimenting with interventions for organization, and 29 roughly of them failed, or really more like 25 of them failed, but some stick. And those that do stick, and they're all very low cost experimentation and failure that then ends up uh, ultimately focusing. And this is both American censorship and open Congress, which gives more specific information about who is doing what in Congress, is uh, um, uh, are, are produced by Fight for the Future. That's that's when um, I'm going to beg your forgiveness, all of you, uh, um, um, and take a few more weeks. Um, a few more things to focus uh, uh, on. Um, the Business Software Alliance suddenly turns around and changes its position and go, comes out against uh, software. This creates a new dimension of battles, which, in, which, I, which then we see from the data creates a, a, a new model of, of intervention. So before we get there, though, one of the things we saw throughout was the mobilization of expertise. Instead of having the very traditional models of the lobbyists being able to bring the experts, the network mobilizes experts and then throws their opinions out. In this case, it's Eric Goldman analyzing one of the alternatives to SOPA and what happened and what didn't happen. Was it worth it? Was it not? But we see this throughout where a particular article, you certainly have links to SSRN becoming very big or something like that, where expertise gets hauled in. Tech, tech people write about the internet DNS security. That gets pushed up by the thing. So that's one major thing. The second major thing is look at the difference. Remember the difference between static and dynamic visions of how debate occurs. Here's one week in December and here's the next. Reddit suddenly appears. Why does Reddit suddenly appear? One person says, hey, I need to renew my domain by the end of the uh, calendar year. And GoDaddy is on this list that the Congressional Committee put as supporters of SOPA. I'm going to shift somewhere else. So suddenly the domains.com says, hey, we're going to give you a special discount if you move over from GoDaddy as long as they don't. It takes less than 24 hours for GoDaddy to say, sorry, sorry, we're against SOPA. We don't do this. Now, not all consumer boycotts are that easy to do. But to organize, but this is new and this is different. And this then gets translated very quickly into a situation where a place like Joystick that connects, that connect, that connects to a variety of other mommy's best blog, major league gaming, uh, rock, paper, uh, 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 shotgun. Uh, a whole bunch of game sites where game developers and game users are using support forums to push the game companies for why they don't have their professional association do what the BSA did and come out in opposition to so on. So this is not in the blogosphere, it's not political, it's not in mainstream media, it's people using where they are with their passions to turn around the mobilization that's uh, political. And then ultimately, uh, we come to uh, the end of the story with the Wikipedia shutdown, and the network looks like this. But it would be a profound mistake to imagine that this is the shape of the debate. You simply won't, don't understand the dynamics and who play if you suddenly believe it's all about Wikipedia and American censorship and Google, who comes in very late and actually. Uh, let me go very quickly through the net neutrality story. Um, and then, uh, uh, and then uh, again, so we can have more conversation. Um, one thing we did differently here is we pulled data on Twitter, on Bitly, and with Google Trends uh, to look at what other sources of data there are that may or may not correlate. Um, the overall image suggests something where the traditional media are much more widely engaged than they were, but even here we see patterns that are quite distinct. Uh, this is just a numerical version of the same thing. Again, things that are driven partly by government action. Here there's the court decision that net neutrality, uh, as it was passed, was, it was uh, um, um, 
uh, violated the statute. Here you have White House and FCC response. The FCC again responds. But then there are things that are outside. There's the John Oliver video. There's internet slowdown then, an expectation of the final comment period. And there's President Obama's statement. In each case, what's interesting is the blue line in both cases are the stories from Media Cloud. You see how the activity correlates very well both with, both with tweets and with searches. Uh, on Google, something external or in this case internal is driving both of these, but they're all part of it. That gives us some confidence. When you look at the thing that is driven by the reports from the FCC, the shape of the public sphere looks very much with very strong role for the Post, the Times, the Journal, the Epic Times, um, and some to the others. You see Speaker Boehner here uh, coming out with a statement that's very highly linked, uh, uh, relatively speaking. But then you have this weird intervention of John Oliver. Remember, this is the same technique. The same technique. This is how the network looks. Using the same technique with the same database. Just to remind you. So this 20 million brilliant segment, which is actually quite deep, not city. The FCC then tweets and says right after he says go and, and, and comment to the FCC that their comment system collapses. Uh, plays an enormous role. But interestingly, when you look at the actual peak, it's a little lower than the first deadline. It's substantially lower than the internet slowdown day, which is the final, which is the five days before the final comment period. And this one looks very different. This one looks much more like SOFA paper. In fact, Battle for the Net includes that uh, is basically run by the allies who ran SOPA, uh, who ran the SOPA PIPA uh, campaign. Fight for the Future is here, Free Press is here, uh, the Satellite Foundation does a very close analysis of the first 800,000 comments, uh, and what we see is this. And then finally, the President uh, 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 announces his support for net neutrality, and this changes the dynamic. Uh, of everything else. Now it's important to recognize this comes after the election. The president has done several things since then that have essentially thrown out the idea of working with Congress. So it's entirely possible that it's true, true, and unrelated. The president just decided to do something that was very popular uh, with a certain uh, left audience, just like with immigration, just like with um, um, uh, contractors. It's possible. There's a version of the story that's an inside story that's about Tumblr and a bunch of, of uh, 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 West Coast small companies successfully maneuvering the White House into doing this against Node, not only Comcast and AT&T um, 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 and Verizon, but also against Google, who were perfectly happy with the net neutrality rules that before. So I'm a little skeptical just on the weight uh, of that. But there's no question that this massive uh, uh, um, uh, you've got over 2 million anti uh, 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 pro net neutrality, as it were, or pro reclassification comments going to the FCC uh, by the end of uh, by the end of this. A couple of more points, and then I'll finish uh, because I've gone way over. Um, there were 2 million comments to the FCC that were against reclassification. They got no play. Not in the traditional media, not in the online media. They succeeded. It was essentially one company, American Commitment, that's an email marketing or some other less uh, attractive people would call it spam marketing um, 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 outfit that got two million comments that were all forum comments. They fell completely flat. The entire debate was dominated by pro net neutrality. So this is a classification based on pro neutral or anti net neutrality and how linked they were to the network public sphere, completely dominated by the pro. This most linked to anti is Senator Cruz saying that net neutrality is like a volunteer for the internet. Every single link to it mocks it and says that it's a terrible idea. There is no network that's organic that's pushing uh, in favor. Once you go to a more mobilization site like Twitter, it's all one thing. It's all pro net neutrality. Once you go to Bitly, um, it's more mixed, but again, it's pro and neutral. There is no uh, anti. So that essentially, the network environment is completely blanketed by pro net neutrality statements, analysis, mobilization, and then you have uh, uh, this uh, resolution. Apologies for going over, but that's that's my your comments. Thank you, guys.
the bar. More <coughs> Thanks for the uh, opportunity to, to uh, read these papers. I think they're a better compliment to say that we're teaching policy processes next semester. And I've already said that this to the syllabus because I think they're such, um, such a new and unique thing we can talk about uh, in a class that where people are interested in how to implicit what policy process. So I think this is just a terrific account of how the internet disseminated knowledge and mobilized lobbying activity in, in the debates over these two, these two issues. So how that approaches um, I also teach non-market strategy sometimes at Wharton. And so when I was thinking about this, this, these cases, I was thinking about how I would how I present this when I was teaching non-market strategy. And to me, in both cases, we an outsider, it seemed like we had traditional Silicon or Silicon Valley interests that played that group, the things like Google or Netflix, going against more traditional business interests, big Hollywood, big telecom. Um, and, and and so I wanted to kind of think about how I might how I might frame uh, a debate like that. Um, Let's run through a couple things before I do that. Just let's respond to the talk. I, I disagree that this paper doesn't have a proof in it. Um, I mean, this is an existence proof. It's an existence proof that this type of this type of activity can happen in uh, what might be seen as a best case scenario for this type of uh, organic organic um, uh, lobbying to occur. And so, uh, I do think there's a, there's a proof in, 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 in that sense. Um, I was also a little bit surprised that that like to hear a little bit more about. How I should be thinking about these different interest groups. You kind of referenced at the end how Google was how Google was positioned on this, and so I might be getting it completely wrong when I'm thinking of this as uh, uh, as Hollywood versus versus Google. It's possible like, that, that Google actually is is, um, is more nuanced than I'm assuming. And part of that goes to this John Oliver book that we briefly referenced. I, I think we have to appreciate just how funny it is that John Oliver is able to shut down the FCC website on the basis of talking about. Net neutrality. So this is a really ironic thing that's happening. And I went back and watched a clip by a CNN at the time, and um, Alper is lamenting how much lobbying power a uh, big business like Comcast has in Washington. It's pointing out that Comcast spends $17 million on, on lobbying uh, that year. Um, not really acknowledging that the next person or next uh, next business on that list is Google, who's also spending $17 million in, in, in lobbying. And so uh, it, John Oliver was kind of pitching this as David versus Goliath, and it wasn't as clear to me that this was necessarily a David versus Goliath story. Um, I taught uh, interest groups in intro American politics yesterday, and the first thing I always do when I teach interest groups is, is present the class the, the Will Wilson Lowy matrix, which is essentially trying to predict what, what type of competition is going to happen when interest groups are, are, are competing in, in a lobbying domain. Um, and when I'm thinking about this case, uh, not, not having read the paper, my initial instinct is this is going to be a classic case of interest group politics, where uh, that we have some people who have some really concentrated costs uh, associated with uh, some, some bill being adopted, and some people that have uh, some really concentrated benefits uh, as a result of policy changes. So there's two things that struck me as really interesting as part of these cases. So the first was how um, the, we'll call them the tech lobby, was able to, s to establish what the status quo policy was. Um, and that's really important in, in, when we're thinking about the, the Wilson Lowy matrix because generally we think whatever the status quo policy is going to be advantage in the policy making process. And, and, and reading through and reading through these cases, it became pretty clear that um, that the that the tech interests were very much able to establish their position as a status quo, and any change that was going to happen it was it was a change to that status quo. And so when we're thinking about costs and benefits in this in, in this in this context, we're thinking about the status quo. quo Quote, policy uh, you know, is going to have to, in order, in order to change things, it's going to have to have extra, extra lobbying, extra lobbying behind it. But I think more interesting is how this grassroots roots effort was able to take something that at least to an outsider would seem like interest group politics, people are in companies that had a lot of, a lot on the line, and change it into what we call entrepreneurial politics, which is making it seem like uh, this was a, this was something that was going to benefit the public. Uh, and there's all these internet users out there who are going to benefit a little, and as a result, they're going to be able to take it to big business who had these had these concentrated costs. And at least the perceptions and the way John Oliver was presenting this to to his audience was that this was a, this was a case of entrepreneurial politics where the little guy might actually be able might, might be able to win. And from a from a non-market strategy perspective, it seems like the traditional business interests, the, the Hollywood uh, the Hollywood interests, uh, the Comcast and AT and T's, the telecoms, they were completely unprepared for this fight. Uh, one thing when we teach interest groups to, to MBA is we talk about having the, the importance of moving first and being on the, being on the ground. And it seems like they had nothing prepared at, at all being, uh, to be able to combat the effort that's going to take place. 
So then, for thinking, if we're going to take this into a broader uh, framework and try to think about this as, as part of the DCC seminar, I think we want to think about whether this is actually a good thing for democracy. Uh, and I think if we're, if we're relying on uh, John Oliver's account for this, uh, it seems like it is. And on one hand, the public is rarely so engaged in the legislative process, particularly the rulemaking process on, on technical issues like, like net neutrality. Um, but I think there's this lingering concern when we see all these data about whether the public is representing the public interest or, or Silicon Valley's interest in, in, in you know, how they're expressing their opinions. Um, as someone who doesn't thought, hasn't thought about net neutrality much at all in, in my life and is thinking back to when I took industrial organization, it's not at all obvious that, that, that consumers are either going to benefit or not benefit from the, the net neutrality uh, uh, as, a, as a broad conceptual issue. It's going to depend on the market power of the broadband providers, heterogeneity and consumer preferences, the extent to which internet capacity is constrained. And so as a just general, as a general thought, until we know more about how the industry is structured, I don't think there's, a, there's an a priori uh, prediction that says, oh, consumers are going to benefit from, from net neutrality or not. Um, but that, that sort of subtlety didn't really come out in the, in the beta, as far as I could tell. It was more this David versus Goliath story that, that's going around, uh, going around the internet. And so, as a, as a potential concern for democracy of what you see um, coming out of this, do we see the interests of certain consumers and tech providers getting extra influence because of the ease at which they can be mobilized uh, via the internet? Um, is, is it making them have too much potential power that they, they can convey? Uh, we, we talked about the GoDaddy, um, the GoDaddy boycott. Uh, it was a single Reddit. Uh, uh, user is able to apply immense political pressure, uh, consumer pressure, very quickly that, that caused GoDaddy to change its, its political stance. And so I think the question is, is this, is this a good thing for democracy? And, and maybe the counter example of this, what we saw happen with the South by Southwest um, uh, uh, schedule this year, where uh, this is not a, a, a governmental voting function, but it's a, uh, it's a crowdsourced uh, panel system where the panels that get the most votes are supposed to be the panels that are going to uh, going to going to take place. And uh, I'm not particularly familiar with this. I'm sure there's more people here that are uh, the Gamergate, which is essentially an issue uh, with uh, uh, female characters in video games being portrayed uh, negatively or stereotypically. And there's there a panel that was trying to take on uh, take on the issues associated with the, with, with this. Uh, but it took one Reddit user, uh, potentially maybe maybe more, to start a, to start a thread that was that was designed to vote down the potential of this panel showing up and and, and essentially crowdsource it off the program. Eventually, it gets it does get enough votes, but it gets canceled out of, out of fears of security. And so, I think what we can see from from these cases is that the, the the internet has this potential to bring a lot of new people into the political process and engage in the legislative and rulemaking process. Uh, but it also has the possibility of doing this in a way that brings a very non-representative group to the front and is able to mobilize people who might not necessarily share the public interest view. And so when trying to think about whether this is good for democracy, I think that is a, that is something that future research should, should be addressing. Uh, so I'm going to keep these comments brief just because there's lots of people here and uh, I want to give everyone a chance to speak. So thank you for the opportunity to read these papers and I really appreciate it. Um, you had a uh, graph, sort of, at the beginning of your talk where you showed roughly how much attention was being paid uh, to the SOPA situation, uh, particularly after Wikipedia uh, came out and, and shut down for a day. And I'm wondering how that graph compares to what we might have seen you know, 15 years ago, where we had more just mass media information system where people couldn't necessarily get information on the internet and organize that way. Is there a difference? Sort of what is the so, so two things. One, the SOPA EPA graph doesn't inc it includes only links, which really means attention here is attention by people who are writing online linked stories. So it's not necessarily mass. Um, when you're talking about attention, um, fifteen. Yeah, probably 15 years ago, certainly 20 or 25. Uh, the only equivalent to that is does it show on the 6 o'clock news or not? So uh, this is in some sense in response to Mark's last question of is democracy a good thing or a bad thing or do we prefer a republic? Uh, uh, the core 
claim I made in Wealth of Networks in defense of um, distributed pathways to frame a debate, set the agenda, mobilize opinion, express it publicly, was that by the end of the 20th century, we got to a point where there was a relatively small number of gatekeepers who were able to determine whether or not uh, something was or was not on the agenda. The only way you got to that level of attention is if you got on prime time news in one form or another. And one way to do that was to stage a very visually attractive protest on the street that would be good TV. Um, you could do it if you were a head of state. You could do it if you were a big company. You couldn't do it if you were, well, it was harder to do it as a distributed public. Um, the claim was that a system that actually provides multiple pathways for lots of different people to organize and cluster around their own interest in groups and be able to um, climb up an attention backbone to a point where they're visible, that increases the number of voices and, and loosens the number of points of control of the network. What you see there with Wikipedia is uh, the culmination of that. But in that regard, actually, I'd say AmericanCensorship.org uh, is even more powerful because there you don't have a place that already has a lot of attention from some other ones being repurposed by its own internal deliberations to something that's a public debate. That, in some sense, it's a really interesting democratic alternative to a company deciding to spend money on something. But it's more like that. Whereas American censorship is genuinely just, here's a site, we're back for the net. Here's a site. We set it up special purpose for this. Let's go out there, call your friends, tweet your friends, let them know. Let's get up this on this particular day. And that's the real sign of a potential workaround over any traditional. Because Wikipedia, the downside of Wikipedia is that if it were the only pathway, then really, again, you fall back on a slightly bigger set of potential places to capture the attention, but not, uh, uh, but not um, Google, just again, one more response. Mark. Google is actually interesting in this regard, because it's clearly against so paper, but it reaches an accommodation to the telcos on net neutrality. And Google wants, so net neutrality is good for anyone for whom money is no object. Or rather, the absence of net neutrality regulation. Google can reach agreements with Comcast and Verizon to get preference for its uh, uh, data, in which case no one else can compete effectively. Um, and so Google essentially flips on the net neutrality debate and ends up being on the same side as the telcos, um, uh, even though it wasn't there five to ten years ago. Um, and so in that regard, it's actually the number of companies that are on the pro net neutrality side is actually, the, the number may be big, but the size is relatively small. The big, new economy companies have come to an accommodation in many senses. Netflix is the one player that, that, that really is, is playing on the net neutrality, the pro net neutrality. So, I'll just want to give you a chance, Mark, if I want to direct a question to you, you didn't say that it's just between democracy and the republic. And you were talking about there is not necessarily, a, if I understand what you're saying, there's not necessarily an identity between the expression of things on the net and democracy itself. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, I probably didn't say it as elegantly as I could have, but the, the point I was trying to get across was that uh, you have one side to side and one audience that's very easily mobilized um, when you, you, you make the, the, these, these websites that they go to. Uh, give them direct links to Congress. There, there may be a whole other set of people, uh, uh, potentially uh, low, people in low-income communities who don't currently have good access to internet. I don't know if they would benefit or not from net neutrality, but those people wouldn't be able to be mobilized in the same way by uh, a, a lobbying effort that's primarily driven at people who are heavy users in the tech community. And so I think the concern isn't so much about the republic, but whether on, on issues where heavy tech users maybe don't have preferences that are in line with the public interest or their preferences will get overweighted when uh, the internet facilitates uh, them having more easy, uh, more of their preferences more easily known and better represented by government. 
So that's actually really interesting. There are, I mean, I don't have the data here, but we have a couple of uh, studies. We do mention in our paper the Susan G. Cohen Foundation story, where which is not because we're looking for some of these non-tech uh, 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 things, where you see a very similar dynamic with a very different uh, demographic. I think one of the things that's been very clear is that Black Lives Matter actually uh, 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 actually is a mode of organizing. And we have one of the teams is working on looking at how that got structured. Um, although again, um, there's a very interesting piece that came out of Ethan's side of the collaboration on Trayvon Martin, uh, which suggests more of a role for uh, uh, um, um, black media, newspapers, the family, and less for mobilized online. Um, uh, which may or may not have much to do with access as opposed to what were the particular. But even there, different platforms are different. So if you look at Ferguson, different algorithms are different. Facebook really doesn't show uh, Ferguson for almost 24 hours after it's been trending on Twitter because the algorithm is still focused on Facebook. And so it, we talk about network, but it's not all the same. And Facebook has a different algorithm, and Twitter in that regard is more user-driven and less algorithm-driven. And that's exactly the kind of, to my taste, detailed question. But the reason that I was, in addition to being asked, the reason that I said democracy versus republic is because the concern about, the concern you raise now, which is that there's unequal access to the capabilities, is different from the concern of whether it's in the public good or not. That was the, the focus on, is it really efficient or is it, is it in the public good or not? What I heard was very much, uh, 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 was very much uh, the arguments in Socrates against letting the, uh, the, 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 the people who drive the ox cart make decisions about, um, uh, about that. And that's part of the tension. And part of the concern is you have these unwashed masses who are not expert showing up, which is has a certain degree of trust in the wisdom or at least plausibility of mass participation, as opposed to largely speaking elite politics that are susceptible to shocks from the outside so that we don't get excessive with it. So that was the non-masking version, longer version of the program. So, uh, so thank you very much. Um, and uh, we did begin this year with um, uh, Cass Sunstein being gloomy about the internet and uh, democracy. In your case, for uh, the democratic potential is refreshing. Um, and I agree with Mark that you do at least have an existence proof. You do have two cases where internet activism seemed to affect policy. But uh, I wanted to get your thoughts on how generalizable these cases are in one particular regard. These are subject matters involving internet issues, and that not only mobilizes, perhaps, the internet community more than some other issue does, uh, other, other issues might, but it's also possible that policymakers are more responsive to internet activists on internet issues than they would be to internet activists on other issues, you know, just as GoDaddy has to worry about a call for boycott because it's going out to all the people who purchase websites from it, maybe uh, the uh, members in Congress, people in the White House, are more responsive to these internet activists when they're talking about regulating uh, the internet and on other matters like Black Lives Matter, maybe they pay more attention to street protests than what they see on the internet and in that case uh, these might be uh, cases that wouldn't apply more generally. What do you think? So, uh, I agree on one. I'm skeptical about the other. Um, the reason I was so reticent to call this more than an inquiry into the dynamics of when it works than proof is precisely for the reasons you described. That is to say, it is about the union. It is uh, uh, the central things that have been central for over 10 years to the identity of people who live a lot of their lives caring about internet related issues. Um, this is the most activated community. Um, the place 
where you could see or should have seen it emerge um, and um, we've had problems really wrapping because of the size of the controversy, wrapping ourselves around that at the moment, is Patriot Act renewal and surveillance. And so I don't have the answers for that yet. We have, we're, we're, we're swimming in amounts of data that we haven't quite been able to parse yet. Um, so I agree that this is a real question. Um, This is this is this is very 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 preliminary, uh, but if you look at what we did with the ten California propositions, uh, none of which are internet related, you do see that the G. Uh, so so one way of seeing whether a controversy is an, a network controversy or, low or not is uh, the number of stories relative to uh, related to the controversy versus the number of, this is actually 10 links, sorry. Uh, the number of links versus the number of stories because network media tend to be more leaky. And so you see that the GMO prop 37 is really completely separate from where everybody else is. These are all traditional media. This is the only one that has a network component. And you see here, what happens here is that you get uh, a lot of support throughout most of the campaign that looks like this also with relatively low spending, much lower spending for the number of stories available. And then at the last minute, the traditional, uh, uh, the, the traditional players come in and reshape the debate together with some expertise, and this loses. It's not a winning proposition, but certainly in the area of GMOs in California, which again is a state that you saw at least one of these 10 campaigns being very much low cost, high visibility, high success, though not all the way through, the end. But on the other hand, you saw all of these others, none of which actually did that. In some cases, uh, uh, specifically because the, the people who ran the campaign basically don't believe in network mobilizing. They got, uh, uh, they got uh, um, attestation from, from uh, attorneys, from, from, from prosecutors, that three strikes in your album was a terrible idea. They just didn't go. But this is propositions being voted on by voters? Yes. Now, then to the second point yeah. about, um, here's the thing, I, it's hard for me to imagine that any agency on any subject that would get two million phone calls to its um, uh, switchboard, the way Congress got to soap and pipa, or four million comments the way that the FCC got, would ignore them, whether or not it's, uh, it, the particular activity was not on an activity, the particular activity was a quick dial button that actually then somebody was on the phone to the switchboard saying, let me talk to my representative so and so. I can't imagine that, that, that that's not going to sway a position. The trick is to get enough people to actually care enough to do it. Okay, so I want to thank Mark for bringing up uh, the South by Southwest, because it seemed to me that his remarks closes with a challenge, because this is, not just democracy, the ugly side of democracy, but this is arguably terrorism. These women are being threatened with violent rape, with murder, they've gone into hiding. Um, these events are canceled. We wanted to bring them for a conference in May, uh, in March. Uh, we were told in no uncertain terms, forget it, you can't invite them uh, to Penn. Um, so what about that challenge that, Mark's, that Mark has uh, raised that, that, that's, uh, by using South by Southwest as an example of, you know, the use of the internet for, for different kinds of, of terrorism rather than just democracy, dem democratic deliberation. Um, I'm not going to stand here and defend uh, a claim that the internet necessarily democratizes or necessarily um, uh, improves discourse. I'm not going to stand here and say that the same features that allow relatively, uh, that, that allow groups of people that don't hold traditional sources of power in society to communicate or act effectively um, can be used by more or less fringe more or less aggressive, more or less terrible uh, people uh, to send their message out. Um, 
ISIS uses YouTube videos in a way that very few uh, other uh, um, uh, organizations or, 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 or campaigns can. Um, and that's terrible. Um, so I'm not making a claim that uh, the internet necessarily improves the quality of public discourse. I'm making the claim that the internet successfully produces workarounds around traditional points of control, historical points of control, particularly around points of control of either major market players or uh, the state, uh, in ways that allow, in the cases that I identified here, for um, uh, uh, democratic participation. But I don't think it would be plausible, given where we are, to make a claim that all, uh, uh, all mass participation or all mass action, not really expression, all mass action is necessarily um, um, morally acceptable, normatively desirable, improving of the quality of public discourse, that's that's not that's not a claim I make, and it's not a claim that my studies could, could plausibly support. I, I'm not sure that, that whether that answers. I mean, I'm, it obviously wouldn't be helpful for me to stand up here and say what happened with Game of Game is terrible. You know that I mean, it's not the issue. The issue is what we learn from about these cases, or at least the issue I'm taking. What does that tell me about what I can and can't learn from these cases? I can't learn that having a society with fewer points of control in the hands of traditional actors, government actors, and major corporations will necessarily result in democratic discourse that I will consider to be normatively attractive. I will say that it will result in a loosening of points of control, and that one important effect of that will be an uh, uh, increased possibility of, of social mobilization. But we have abuses of, of open systems all the time. But the, the data you present here, and what you started to talk about in Black Lives Matter, have the hints of some more structure of when this sort of mobilization uh, will likely be more, get more traction. And I understand this isn't this is early, but can you start to speculate or give us some preliminary thoughts on what we might learn about when it's more likely to be effective as a workaround, or perhaps when it's likely to be uh, have some potential deleterious effects? Is there anything that you've got your preliminary thoughts on starting to move this? Because it's a very rich story, and you're pulling out the complexities, and even within your stories, the mobility of the different actors within there really it's, it begs for some sort of exploration. Any thoughts? Um, I don't think the net makes the politics. I think the net allows for less curated expression of underlying dynamics. And so uh, when you say, um, maybe I'm misunderstanding and overstating what the question is, but uh, when you say, what is there that I can say in a more structured form about whether this succeed or not, um, the reason that I'm reticent is because uh, I think that what you do see, again, very preliminarily, in the case of Black Lives Matter, in the case particularly early on in the campaign, not later, is that something that was enormously painful to begin with, but marginalized, in media that were more controlled, was able to find its way out in uh, more open uh, uh, media. And in that regard, but, but, it, but it's not a situation where it would. Once there was an activation in background in society, once there were a set of people who had a set of ideas about how to push it forward, there were pathways that allowed it to overcome um, um, barriers that 15 years ago were constrained. constrain. Uh, but um, 
They don't have it. I think it's good. It, it, I don't have a, a theory about which structures of belief or anger would necessarily succeed or not succeed. I would have predicted, for example, that around patriotic renewal and the NSA uh, surveillance, you would have uh, an equivalent coalition to the one that worked uh, in Sopa Pippa, and that even if Congress ultimately pushes through because it believes uh, the same people, the same communities, the same alliance should have worked. People who were working on the same time around and actually won on net neutrality tried to make it. They didn't. Um, and, so, and so it's still, to my taste, very, very messy. Um, I don't have a, a, a theory that connects technology to when it will succeed or not. I think we need to see more of it. Mark, if I understand what you were saying, you know, Bill Kai just said he doesn't think the net creates politics, and that's a pretty strong also play, but you, your presentation, if I'm being fair with it, suggests that it in fact might shape it to some extent. Is that, am I capturing something of what you're saying, that there is a, it's a less sort of politics <coughs> prior to the internet, you see them being more um, interwoven with each other? And it kind of comes down to your definition of what, what it is politics, uh, uh, issues, issues are going to exist before they're on the internet almost by definition, um, but I guess the question becomes, it's slightly changing around to for your question, which is to what extent is this just agenda setting, or to what extent is this actually uh, uh, persuading persuading beliefs, and, uh, and and to the extent it's agenda setting and making things salient, to what extent is it just activating people who already had, already had a specific opinion versus bringing new people in, uh, new, new people into politics who you were involved with the issue in the first place, and I am not an expert on this at all, so other people know more. I think it's fairly clear from, that you, from the net neutrality things we saw that an important part of it was bringing new people. Um, and you didn't see that, uh, uh, that, that, that the most shared link on the Bitly side of the video was uh, a site called Funny or Die, Porn Stars Explain Net Neutrality. That's clearly going to bring. Uh, people who are not already uh, John Oliver for sure. Right? The idea that net neutrality would be something that would be a major political issue five years ago, it's sort of a side, uh, it's sort of a side issue of a side issue. So there's some of that, and some of it is mobilization and focusing on the problem. Okay. Uh, actually, I wanted to ask a question on your uh, presentation about the choice of sources. You analyze because in the Silver Paper paper, uh, you state that you resigned from tracking nuclear responses because they would probably show the similar similar dynamics to uh, the sources you actually do analyze. And then in the net neutrality paper, you track Twitter, and then you come up to the solution that actually the statement that actually. Um, it uh, brings, uh, it, it gives uh, more of the responses, uh, like call to action responses, uh, than all the other sources. And also, we claim that actually all of those communicants uh, kind of bring the uh, usually non politicized uh, entities and, and subjects uh, to engage into the political discourse. Uh, and then my question is like, why did you resign? Because like in this uh, net neutrality paper, uh, there was a significant difference between the responses from the Twitter users and the uh, other sources. And then you resigned from doing it in the other paper. And also uh, my question is, don't you think that picking Twitter as a social media platform to analyze? Uh, is it a bit risky just because uh, people who make use of Twitter, the specifics of this platform, it actually attracts uh, subjects that are already interested in that political? So how does that Okay, so those are, those are very good questions. Um, the first question is why did we drop why did, we, why did we not do Twitter the first time around and then move it? The first time around, in the earlier paper, so 
I was very focused on making sure that we had um, a very good uh, uh, and complete sets. And Twitter, you don't have the same quality access. And so in the first paper, we just basically said we can't match at the same quality. Um, and then we saw a better of it after that paper and decided for the next one that even though the, the Twitter data was not as complete, the timestamps were a little more complicated in terms of how the links from it. It was harder to do the dating of the links. Uh, we ended up deciding that that was worth it because it gave us enough of, a, of an alternative perspective. So what you're seeing is essentially the evolution in our own thinking of what the trade-offs are between having no Twitter and having uh, an imperfectly matched uh, uh, set from Twitter, and we basically decided that you get enough difference <coughs> relative to what we originally thought that it was worth it. Um, yes, what we learned from the materials is that Twitter is more politically motivated, that it's more politically mobilized, um, and that allowed us to say something about how uh, the mobilized aspect was very pro net neutrality you know, and um, finally you work with the data you can access, right? Facebook won't give us the data. You have to work with their no, I mean, they, you have to work with their internal researchers in order to get at their data. Um, and that creates its own set of issues in terms of who owns the data, whether they use it, what the, the, the and we uh, we don't have that solved yet. So what we have is, the, I mean, look, um, uh, Xavier Defecci has a very nice paper on um, the problem that the easy access to Twitter data creates. Because everybody in their cousin says social media and ends up using Twitter. Why? Because the API is better, it's easier to use, and you get more data. And then we create this problem with the model organism where things that Twitter describes well, we can describe well, and things that Twitter doesn't describe well, we still describe the way it works with Twitter because we don't have the other one. That's, uh, it's, a, it's a bug we know of. Uh, all we can do is admit it and say, to the extent that Twitter reflects, but we don't know what it's, it's getting access to Facebook data puts you in a proprietary framework uh, with having to work with that, and it's just not. But we also don't have access to what we know in some of people was really important, which was some um, uh, uh, private or semi-private mailing lists where people organized uh, on, on the back end. Um, we, that's the data we have. And one of the reasons I insist on mixed methods, the value of mixed methods, the value of acting in our campaign, the value of interviewing people, the value of reading the material, the value of reading the newspaper materials from the same period, is that um, when there's a reasonable coherence between what the data seems to show you from the reward sources and what the immediate on the spot history of the near past analysis allows you to do, you get better confidence in terms of other sources because we're going to do more. So I found it really interesting that you made a point about the generalizability of the mechanisms that made the net neutrality um, movement successful. Um, and I would agree that there are probably some issues with that. Um, and you, further, you made a claim that even though they did work, the incentives weren't necessary, or the, the voice being um, regurgitated wasn't necessarily that of the public. Um, and that that might be a problem for democracy. Um, so presumably, these things will, the mechanism will evolve to something different um, to try and address these two issues um, if they exist. So. Can you guys sort of make a prediction or sort of do you have a vision of where that's heading, how the mechanism that we're using um, is going to evolve to sort of put people um, more directly in contact with um, the actual mechanisms um, shaping the law? 
Okay, so, so let me first of all define two different levels of mechanisms. Um, there are the series of mechanisms that we describe in the paper that are essentially internal to a successful network mobilization that I don't think are actually necessarily limited, uh, uh, even based on just what we've seen on people on the net. So the idea that you can um, harness expertise uh, and that you don't need access to a editorial paper to do so, I think is a characteristic of the technology. And since there are experts in many areas, there's no, I see no reason to think that that's uh, uh, limited to this area. Um, the idea that you can um, um, mobilize, use relatively simple apps to convert uh, commitment into action that is recognizable by state actors like phone impact, etc. That's not limited to, those are very simple apps. You click, you're put through, you can do what you need to do. It's very simple. Th those are, so I think there are internal mechanisms for what work that are in a sense ready for other campaigns. Um, then there's the question of mechanisms of actual mobilization. I want to a little revise what I said earlier about, so uh, we're back to uh, 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 blue or black crime, black lives matter. You can't ignore, and this is technology, the role of a video in every pocket in changing the public discourse on police violence against private police. Um, the visuals of these events are such that they're essentially what broke down the, <clears throat> we reached for my gun story that repeats itself. And that was said. And then the distribution of those videos ultimately makes it to TV, but in that regard is much more like the story we saw in Tunisia and later on in the Arab Spring with people using media around state media. Obviously in places where there are state media, if you read about uh, Turkey and Gezi Park, you really have to work around the control of state media. Here the, 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 the relationship is obviously much more open and more fluid, but there's no question that that's an area, and again, that comes back to the question of who does or doesn't have power and doesn't have access. There's very little question that That's not true. Um, I don't have the data to say that there's very little question. I'm speaking impressionistically uh, as somebody who sort of existed in this space for the last couple of years. What I predict will be the case once we're actually able to do it. That videos were central to changing the debate that the videos made their way around the net through a combination of social media that circulated them online, YouTube, or elsewhere presentations that were then picked up by mainstream media, just like in Tunisia, what was replicated by Nawa was, uh, uh, was picked up by Al Jazeera, and that's how it got to the masses. So the masses saw it on TV, but it came there through social media, that's my prediction of what we're going to see, and that's going to be a place where you have a massively important uh, um, 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 uh, political issue being raised and circulated and reframed. And actually, educate. people are educated through things that only the technology made possible, but the relevant technology is less the network aspect, though that's part of it, and more simply the fact that in every one of our pockets we have a video. So I'll just make three really quick points. I think the first is um, you won't see Comcast get caught with its pants down again. Essentially, they, they, they will have learned from events like this that they have to be that they have to be ready to engage in uh, a, a media fight when they're in, when they're in a regulatory process, uh, so the, the online media fight that they, they weren't ready to do in this past today. And the second thing I think about with these with these congressional contacts is the signal value of these contacts is going to go down the cheaper you make. The, that, that contact. So if you make it so that it's essentially costless for people to contact or members of Congress, it will not be as meaningful when you get 
uh, 2,000 constituents calling in to state their position as it was when it was a more costly act. And so I think there'll be some evaluation of the process the easier the easier it becomes. And then my third prediction would be with respect to the social media that it will act a lot like media in, in the sense that uh, what drives media is things that are new and fresh. And so while I think videos will continue to be important, uh, and one, one reason why they're important now is we haven't had videos before. And so I think uh, as time progresses, new things will come along and, and, and be the new fresh things on social media, and those are the things that we'll, we'll try to do. Let me just refine in one thing, one thing, and respond in one thing, respond in one thing. Um, this is actually an instance where Comcast did know and fail. So you get, well, and, and, and Comcast is not fair here because some of it is not, uh, some of it is not about a company in terms of interest, some of it is uh, uh, declaration and it's a logical position on this. But you actually have efforts to invest in creating network campaigns. So uh, as I said, half the comments at the end of the day that went to the FCC were comments that were produced through a mass email marketing campaign. They just weren't able to capture the public discourse to actually accept it as there's quality, perhaps because they were done poorly, because they were having a form and a spam, perhaps there's a better way. But the effort to create an alternative to back of the net that was anti-net neutrality um, never really took off the ground. And in that regard, to the extent that you can talk about it as the Mars, the fact that you actually have both of these affordances out there, and one of them does capture millions of people and the other doesn't, may be limited to this technology issue. But at least in this technology issue, they actually had, they had several months where they knew they needed to win this campaign online, where there were distinct efforts both by uh, Comcast and AT&T and by um, uh, some of the uh, libertarian uh, sites that have actually been on the other side and so forth. And he never really took off. They weren't able to create that kind of organization. That's just, for this particular area of, of technology, to the extent you could talk about it as democratic as about the, the fact that the affordances existed at least somewhat supports that it's democratic. Any other questions? Well then please join me in thanking both your colleagues.